Hello, readers and writers, and welcome to another edition of How to Write Your First SFF Novel. Uh, we are here today to talk about romance in the science fiction and fantasy genres. It's such an incredible topic. Romance is so big right now, and romance in science fiction has always had a really spectacular hold on readers. My name is Stephanie Clark. I am one of the editors for Orbit, and I will be moderating today's session. Joining me today are four incredible authors from Orbit. We have C.L. Clark, the author of Magic of the Lost series, which began with The Unbroken. Josiah Bancroft, who is the author of the fantasy series, The Books of Babel, as well as Barnes and Noble's speculative fiction pick of October, The Hexologist. Melissa Caruso, who is a number of uh, so many epic fantasy books, including the Swords of Fire series, which began with The Tethered Mage. Her upcoming book, The Last Hour Between Worlds, is the start of a new series and will be published by Orbit in November of 2024. And joining us today as a kind of last minute replacement is uh, Lyra Celine, the debut author of A Feather So Black, which is out from Orbit in March of 2024. We are so excited for you guys to join us for this session. So just a reminder before we dive in of how this is going to work. Um, we have some pre-written questions that we're going to be asking our panelists. They'll be giving us their in-depth answers, teaching you how to function romance within the story structure. Um, we have a Q&A button on the side. It's the little box with a question mark on it. Go ahead and put your questions in there for the end of the session. We will answer as many of them as we can. Um, as a reminder, a replay of this event will be available afterwards, so if you love it, you want to share with your friends, go ahead and send them the link that you use to sign up for this session. And we are ready to dive in. Uh, first, just want to ask to get a general consensus. Um, you know, everyone loves all their books so much, so with minimal spoilers and as vaguely as possible, can you tell us about the role romantic relationships have played in your books? and how they relate to the main plots. What kinds of romantic relationships have they been? Have they been love triangles, enemies to lovers? What kind of tropes do you love to utilize within your stories? And we'll start with Josiah. Um, well, it depends on which series we're talking about. The Books of Babel, my first series, was really about love in its nascent form. You know, it starts off with a, a couple on their honeymoon. Uh, so a lot of that story is more about uh, you know, early love, uh, flirtation at the outset of a, a new relationship. Um, there is uh, some romantic uh, triangulation at a uh, point in the story. Um, but the new book that I'm working on, the new series, The Hexologist, is more of a developed sort of relationship, more mature love between a married couple who have been together for, you know, more than a decade. So I, I'm kind of doing several other things with my series. You know, it's amazing. We don't get to see that too often in these stories, uh, like a more mature, older couple. So it's really exciting for readers to get to experience that. A lot of people are going to gravitate towards that particular kind of romance. That's amazing. Um, we'll go to Sheree next. I don't know why, but I gravitate to the really messed up turbulent romances. So um, enemies to lovers and lovers to enemies are kind of my favorite. I like um, I like I like the the hatred that's so intimate that it is the same as love or that they can't exist quite without the other. Um, and so that is kind of what happens kind of it is what happens in um, the trilogy that I'm working on. Um, the Unbroken and The Faithless, which is the second book, and The Sovereign, which is the third book, which is, you'll see how this love story ends, for better or for worse. Um, and it's got uh, the primary relationship that kind of, that the narrative hinges upon um, with this uh, this conscripted soldier. She starts as a conscripted soldier, Terrain, and Luca, who is the Empire's colonizing princess. Um, and so ostensibly they start on the same side but they have very different um, positions in power. Um, and so the narrative is about how this undeniable attraction they have for each other, despite their opposition, like how all of the politics and this entire colony and empire is, is caught in between um, their feelings for each other. Um, but they also, they start the book with um, different romantic interests um, as well. So we've got, 
Um, we get to see a, a, a relationship that dissolves, um, a relationship that maintains itself with the addition of a new party member. Um, so yeah, a few different kinds, but I like it when it's a little messed up. That's great. It really builds a lot to the characters, getting to see them in different stages of relationships, not just like going right into the romance, but seeing how they end things, seeing how, you know, if they learn lessons from previous relationships that they bring into their next love. That's really cool. Uh, so we're going to go to Melissa next. Uh, yeah, I have. So out of my two published trilogies, the first one um, starts out with a uh, a sort of a love interest who, where there's the classic, well, okay, you have different ranks. Are you actually going to be able to get together? Is one person going to have to make a political match? And then in book two, the potential political match comes in. And I mean, I'll get into this more later, but suffice to say that didn't go how I expected it to go. Um, and I'm not going to spoil anything, but just in terms of that happening in the second book, it was it was was not the original arc I had planned. And there were a lot of surprises coming from that character. Um, and, uh, and that's a very different character who's uh, politically powerful and magically powerful and um, uh, and created a very different dynamic. And then uh, in the second, so that created a love triangle. In the um, in my second series that is not related to the first, uh, I have, uh, it's a little bit like enemies to lovers, except it's more like, is this person my enemy? Is It's more like deeply uncertain uncertainty to lovers. Uh, <laughs> where you don't know if they're your enemy, you don't know what they want, you don't know uh, if they're working with you or against you or if they're going to betray you, which is one of my personal favorites. I kind of I kind of like throwing that in just to add that extra layer of tension. Um, and then in my new book that's coming out next year, it's a uh, your, your uh, rival and nemesis who you always sort of had a, an unspoken thing with, but, uh, but now you're mad at each other uh, kind of situation at the start. So yeah, I like I like to mess things up a little bit too. Not maybe not quite as messy as Sheree does, but <laughs> that'd be hard to beat. But you know, but I like to throw in a little extra tension there too. That's excellent, uh, Lyra. You're up. Yeah, so my book is um, officially a romantic fantasy or a romanticy, as the kids are calling it these days. Um, so romance does play a very large role in it. Um, and I have never met a trope that I didn't like. Um, so we've got just about everything in there. We've got a love triangle. We've got friends to lovers, enemies to lovers. We've even got a, you know, kissing to avoid detection by law enforcement. Um, I didn't quite get the one bed trope in there, but, you know, maybe in book two. Um, so I do think there is a large, um, focus on romance in this book, um, I agree with Sheree, Melissa, um, you know, the angst and the tension is what I really love about, um, about romance. I also think that it's a really great way to um, mirror and reflect the main character's um, emotional arc um, to really show how they may be growing, not only within themselves, but how that is then reflected outwardly to their um, romantic choices um, or people who they find themselves attracted to or falling in love with. Um, so it is something that is very deeply ingrained in A Feather So Black. Um, and it's been it's been really fun to explore that. I absolutely love that. And I love how you're all really well versed in the romance tropes, even though you all write in the speculative fiction genre, um, you know, which is a place where romantic storylines are pretty much always going to be secondary. So for the next question, um, we're really curious how you balance developing a romantic subplot while advancing the main plot in a general sense. Uh, we'll go with Josiah again. Just go in the same order. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I would say that I generally do it poorly. Um, I, I don't do balance very well in my books. I like to do uh, in moderation and obsession. And from that tumbles a story eventually, hopefully. Uh, with the books of Babel, the uh, love triangle really was a propulsion for the entire series. Uh, it was part of the plot. It was in some way advancing uh, the entire story. Uh, and I find that to be like um, a useful thing to understand. Like a love triangle is sometimes uh, denigrated as being sort of a high school drama, you know. But I think what it really does is it, it uh, is a 
symbol or a sort of a metaphorical representation of all of our conflicted desires. I think all of us at one point in our life or another, or in one way or another, can relate to that inability to choose between two desirable things. We want to have the successful professional career and the rewarding family life or home life or domestic life. You know, we we have these conflicting things that we want that we are always fighting to get both of the the uh, eternal problem. And so I think that the, the, you know, the love triangle really represents that in some way, and that makes it relatable. So uh, in my story, yeah, the, the um, question of what these characters actually wanted um, was itself um, a grand part of the plot. No, that's great. Uh, Sheree, talk us through how you were building romance into your plot. Well, kind of inspired by what Josiah just said, I realized like maybe so much of the enemies to lovers, lovers to enemies has to do with like border crossing, like where you're allowed to be, where you're not allowed to be. Um, but that would require some more thought and examination uh, from me. So I'll get back to you guys at a different panel on that thought. But the thing that I, I think about most with Terrain and Luca in particular, and how they, they, they both kind of represent the, they are the microcosm of their respective nations. Um, Terrain is Kazal, the colony, and Luca is the empire. Um, and they both say that at different points. At what Luca wants is what the empire wants. And that is irreconcilable with a colonized person. They don't want that. Um, and they're not going to agree to it willingly. And so figuring out how their relationship goes is how we figure out the the fate of the two nations. And because of the way I ended up writing these characters who have so much power in the decision-making at some point, um, Terrain does not start out with um, great amounts of power. She's just a, a conscripted soldier, but she has a lot of influence at a certain point in the story. So what she decides or how she acts for better or for worse, she does not always make the best choices. Um, influences political ramifications like battles war that kind of stuff and similarly luca's political choices um change the empire and if luca is really into terrain enough to be like well this girl will like me more if i am nice and since i am the queen that means to be nice i should not destroy people then it's going to be a different narrative than if she's like, I like you, but I don't like you that much. So I will destroy the people. And now we see where we go. And so that's kind of how the plot and the relationship are, are wedded together. No, that sounds like a pretty tight balance between, you know, how everyone is uh, focusing their romance within the story. So that's awesome. Uh, Melissa. Yeah, uh, well, for me, so uh, in general, when I'm uh, building romance into plot, right, there are two aspects of plot that I'm trying to build it closely into. Because for me, the romance um, ideally should be integral to the book in some way. Um, and uh, so there's the external plot, and then there's the then there's the character arcs. And of course, romance is always going to hopefully be really important to the arc of the character, which ideally is is what's motivating your plot in the first place. Just like Sheree said, you know, that like that that they're the choices that they're making because of the romance they're involved in are gonna influence how they interact with all the other aspects <coughs> of the plot as well. Sorry, my dog is very annoying. Uh, <laughs> but very sweet. Uh, but um but in terms of the external plot, like in my first series there was um uh, which I know somebody asked I didn't get a chance to type it up, but uh, that this is the Swords and Fire series um uh, that starts with the Tethered Mage. Um, it's a political fantasy, and because uh, the main character is a political heir, uh, the romance is entirely tied up with all the political stuff that's going on because uh, you, they're considering there are these big world events uh, and whether nations are going to go to war, and is a marriage alliance going to potentially be part of dealing with that? So it's very closely integrated into the political plot there. And then also at various points in the series, of course, you know, being romantically involved is a great way to raise the stakes on your character because when you when they love somebody you can you can do terrible things to them and then you know and then stuff happens and it gets interesting um uh and then in the second series it's um again there's some there's some political stuff going on and there um and the characters are from uh, opposing political houses but there's also a lot of magical tension 
um, in my second series, my main, which is uh, Rooks and Ruin, which starts with the Obsidian Tower. One big complication is that my main character, um, her magic is broken such that anybody she touches dies, which is complicating when you want to have a romantic life. Um, and uh, she's uh, now, and the, the person who she winds up being interested in actually because of the type of magic he has, she can potentially touch him without him dying. So like that's, you have to disentangle how much of your interest is because of that. And, uh, and uh, also they both have character arcs where they really have a lot of stuff they have to figure out before they really should be in a relationship with anybody. Um, <laughs> not that that necessarily stops people, but um, characters. Uh, but yeah, uh, and in my, in my third, uh, in the new series that's coming out, I know I have so many, um, the, uh, in the last hour between worlds, um, it's sort of whether they're going to be able to work together, despite the fact that they have all of this tension and all of this history is really going to be core to whether they can resolve the plot. Um, so it's almost an obstacle to the plot, but also they're, because they are both very much equipped with what the other person needs to succeed, it's, it's, it's a little, it's a mix of both. Um, but uh, yeah, I always, I also like to have a lot of supporting character relationships and I try my best to make them uh, re relevant to the plot as well where I can. Um, so it's not just like the only romantic relationship in the world is the main character and nobody else matters. You know, like I usually have some supporting characters with their own stuff going on and try to work that into the character arcs as well. And it, it determines things like, okay, well, the person A is not going to act rationally about person B because they're involved in a romantic relationship with them or they see them as a rival or whatever. There's a lot you can do because we all need characters to make bad decisions sometimes. <laughs> and it's a good lever for that. Um, so, you know, uh, because character is the driving force for plot, it just can factor in in so many different ways. And I like to try to really check and make sure that they're integrated as I go. And sometimes I have to integrate them a little more in edits. That actually folds perfectly right into our next uh, question, uh, which is really talking about the characters and how, um, you know, you can center a story and romance around one character or potentially have parties with secondary characters that are romantic and potential partners who are on, you know, maybe lesser equal footing to the story's importance. Um, so we want to know how do you choose the weight of each character's importance to specifically the romance portion of the story? Um, and we will come back to Lyra for the other question and her thoughts on plot and romantic balance when she's back in. Um, so we'll go back around to Josiah. Um, I think um, effectively I want all of my characters to find happiness and love. That's like a, when I think about fantasy, I just want them all to have a good time and be happy. And that that love looks different for different characters. You know, I have characters who are looking for more of a familial love or more of a romantic love or even like just sort of a self-fulfilling um, self-love. And I think that all those are, are valuable and interesting. Um, but everyone, I want to give everyone a chance to um, be appreciated, appreciated and understood, uh, listened to, doted upon, uh, because I find that just to be compelling. And so like that's like the, the, the softy in me. Uh, everyone is going to get a chance, uh, you know, to, to find love. You know, so many people forget that there's different kinds of love that you can write into the story, not just romantic. Um, it's amazing that you can write that in there, like really think about like which character is guiding their wants towards which kind of love. That's wonderful. Um, so we'll go to Sheree next for character. Um, I think, so uh, I, I don't know if it's actually the romance that ended up being why I weighted the narratives this way or the, I think it was more my interest in, in depicting the different sides of a colonial struggle. And um, it, so yes, Terrain and Luca, um, the soldier and the princess are involved with each other in various ways across the series. Um, but I think it was more I wanted each side of the struggle to be weighted equally um, so that we can see voices we don't often see in fantasy kind of narratives. Because it's always it's very often, ah, look at the great royals. And we see that story, but I wanted to show them both um, equally that way. But I really did have fun, um, kind of like Josiah said, again, um, just having other char side characters have little moments of joy and love and heartbreak that is equally as compelling as the main narrative. Um, 
like I have an older lesbian couple in um, The Unbroken who I think in some readers' minds definitely overshadowed the main pairing in terms of favorites. Um, and then like, you know, as things progress, um, other characters get different relationships, different kinds of relationships. Um, and while though they're side characters, um, how they get to interact um, with their new romantic or otherwise interests uh, impacts how they relate to the main character. So it's a side, it's a side relationship, but it changes that character enough that their relationship to the main character changes as well. Um, and then I think um, that I, I, there's, like I said earlier, the princess has um, other lovers um, and how she relates to them as things change with terrain. Um, some of them she grows closer to, some of them she grows farther away from. I think that though those are side characters, it again impacts her in such a way, um, as well as the narrative in such a way that, well, and terrain. So it's it's everybody. You can't, you, it's like a ping pong. You can't, you can't um, throw one, one little ball without hitting all the other things. So, or marble, not ping pong, but yeah. So Terrain and Luke are the big ones and everybody else is still ping ponging on them. <laughs> I think ping pong is an accurate analogy. Flinging it everywhere, it's kind of like bouncing off the walls, like hitting all the little points you want to hit. That makes sense. Um, Melissa, I'm going to give you a chance to talk character in a second, but I want to go back to Lyra, um, who didn't get to talk about the balance between plot and romance and also kind of touch on her characters within the romantic subplot. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, sorry again for all the technical difficulties. I'm not sure what's going on, but hopefully it's gone now. Um, yeah, so I think um, the balance between plot and romance is always a really interesting one to me because I think... Um, when done well, the the romance isn't just icing on the cake, but something um, that really holds the story together, at least in my book. Um, you know, I think Sheree talked a little bit about the high stakes involved in, in, you know, her character's romance. And I think in my book, the character stakes aren't quite that high. Um, but I do think that some of the plot outcomes do in fact revolve around some of the decisions um, the main character, Fia, makes about who she wants to um, ultimately be with and spend her life with. Um, so I think in some ways, balance maybe isn't really the right word, but more how that thread is woven throughout and what elements of the plot it interacts with and is integrated with. Um, you know, so I think, you know, if she chooses one man over another, that affects how the outcome of the plot, you know, uh, how it goes. So I think um, for my book, at least, um, it's less a balance and more an interweaving um, between the romance and the plot. Um, and then for your second question, it was um, the focus of the characters. Um, yes, how, how, how basically you're choosing to weigh the characters' mm -hmm. romantic story points against the other characters in the story. Yeah, so um, my book is told from the main character Fia's um, point of view. Um, she is a um, you know first person point of view, so it is primarily weighted towards her um, and the romances um, or lack thereof that she's experiencing. Um, it is a love triangle. So in the beginning of the book, um, the love interest is heavily weighted towards um, uh, her prince friend, whose name is Rogan. Um, so she's very much involved in that sort of friends to lovers, you know, will they, won't they? It's been a really long time that they've known each other, um, but there are obviously complications that are keeping them apart. Um, but as the story progresses, you know, that shift of focus as far as romantic partner goes um, does change and is weighted more towards the um, enemies to lovers um, point of the triangle. Um, so I think it's always, um, you know, I think whoever is experiencing the most, um, I guess the highest stakes romance, I think probably whichever has the most impact on the story at any given time is usually what I try to focus on. Um, you know, the, 
I like that metaphor of ping ponging. Um, you know, I think to a, a first person point of view character, um, other people's romantic relationships may have less of an impact on her. So the ping pong isn't necessarily going to hit her as hard. Um, whereas those romances she's experiencing um, herself definitely are more of a focus. Excellent, thanks. Um, and Melissa, you talked a little bit about characters beforehand, but we'd really love to delve a little bit deeper into, you know, how you develop these characters against one another. Um, and if you had in mind their romance, essentially from the beginning. Yeah, um, well, there's uh, one interesting challenge that you have, of course, if you're doing a love triangle, like I was in my uh, first series, unexpectedly, but I was, um, is balancing the multiple love interests um, to keep them both interesting. And I know a challenge that I faced in uh, the second book was that um, one of the uh, two love interests wasn't going to be on screen that much or on the page that much, I guess, uh, because just the way the plot was progressing. And um, and that was the one that had been there from uh, book one. And I didn't want him to get kind of forgotten and sidelined, um, you know, because then it's not really a love triangle. It's more like, a, oh, we just went this way. Uh, <laughs> it's a love change of direction. Um, so uh, and so I know that I was struggling with, well, how do I keep him very present in the story? Um, emotionally, even if he's not there physically. Um, and uh, uh, I found that a technique that worked well for me, uh, and I got actually some great advice from my agent on this, was um, uh, so to up the stakes uh, with the one who you're focusing on, in, in less in terms of page presence, um, so that uh, something is happening that's complicating that re relationship or adding tension to it or making it more fraught in some way, so that even if he's not there, uh, physically that you're thinking about that relationship um, and being like, oh, what's gonna, you know, what's gonna happen there? And that's, and especially in, um, as we moved into book three, I did, uh, I did more of that too. Um, and then, um, yeah, so there's that, Try, trying to balance not only the page, not as much the page time, but the, the sort of how much you're thinking about it and how emotionally significant it is and how tied into the plot and the current happenings it is and what the stakes are. Um, for side characters, um, one thing I really like about having some side character relationships too is that you get to show a different, I mean, this is um, this is science fiction and fantasy, right? It's not genre romance, so it doesn't have to end happily. So when you have multiple relationships, you get a variety of different endings. Um, and you don't necessarily have to feel bad if somebody doesn't get a happy ending because then maybe somebody else gets a happy ending and you know, uh, and you can show it a lot of different possible routes these relationships can take and end them in a lot of different ways. And, uh, and sort of have your cake and eat it too, a little bit. Like, I, I really don't wanna give spoilers, but a lot of my thoughts here focus around, like, I really like bittersweet endings in general, um, but I also like to give uh, my readers something to really feel like they can celebrate. And so I like to hit that balance with multiple characters of making sure that if you really like to celebrate a romantic happy ending, there will be one that you're really invested in that you get to celebrate that for, even if you don't get to celebrate that for all of them. And that makes a lot of sense, like just giving everyone a little something, even if it's not great, like just to like showcase who they are within the story is awesome. Um, so we have a, a few questions that are direct towards each individual author um, about like how you guys brought about the tropes into your series. Um, sure, I want to start with you. A Sierra Magic of the Law series is a very intense enemies to lovers plot, which you told us earlier you really love to write. Um, how did you make their first dislike and then their actual connection feel so genuine? I put them on, actually, so I put them at technically on the same side, but really they're on completely opposite sides with completely different power dynamics. Um, and I actually, I saw someone say recently on the internet, which obviously that was the first problem. Um, <laughs> but they said, they said something like uh, enemies to lovers can only work if they are at the same level, like the same power level. And I was like, oh, well, we'll find out. And I think, yeah, sure. If you want them to like each other, but I think part of enemies to lovers or what I wanted to explore with explore with enemies to lovers was like being true enemies. Like you like you have to hate each other or be so diametrically opposed to what the other person believes in. Um, 
and so I put them, I put Terrain and, and Luca on the same side at first. So they're both, uh, Terrain is a soldier for the Empire. And in fact, she, she idolizes her general. She wants to be better integrated into the army, into the um, em Empire society. And that is the, her driving motivation. And so actually working with the princess is a motivator, uh, is, is, a, is a, it's a benefit for her. She's, she's um, ex excited. She's excited about that in a sense, um, but she's upset about a lot of other things. Um, poor baby. But um, I think that what I wanted to do is is progressively show how their sides, what side they're on, is a bit muddier than it appeared at first, and then to really just hammer in exactly how opposite their their eventual perspectives are like they both come to realize how mutually exclusive the relationship uh or the other person's desires are with their own and i think that that's that's how we establish the enemies part like they might have been in proximity to each other and have been friendly enough maybe even some mutual respect um which was definitely brought on by some self-delusion. Like I think when we're falling for someone, there's always a little bit of self-delusion. Um, <laughs> um, but by the time they realize what I want can never exist as long as you exist. But it's the key factor is, especially as we progress along the, the spectrum of enemies to lovers is it cannot exist while you are the way you are. And so like any good character arc, as character arc changes, then the potential for romance changes as well. So at the beginning, they simply cannot be. Like you see this a lot with with arguments about the like colonizer colonized romances is how the power dynamics are gross, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot more nuance in it but you have to see how the characters change over time. And so getting to the lover's part of the connection, um, and this is not saying anything about um, whether there's going to be a happy ending or not, because again, the, the, the character aspect, the character arcs aspect, um, the idea is, can this character change in the character arc part that is separate from the romance, but also not separate from the romance. And so as in any relationship, whether it's romantic or not, we are asking, we're in some sort of dialogue with the other person. Like, I need you to bend here. I need you to bend there. Can we do it? Okay, yes. So we can take the next step forward. And then we take another step or we take steps back. If you can't make a certain compromise or sacrifice, um, then you don't get to move forward or you fall apart completely or you say and you hammer out that situation until you reach a satisfactory conclusion and then you take another step forward um and that's like the idealized version sometimes you just shit happens and smash <laughs> um yeah i think i think the, the biggest thing is is for the relationship to work i they needed to um deal with all the blood and bodies they have in between them and whether or not they get a happy ending or whatever kind of ending. Um, if they're going to be together, they need to know what they're willing to give up or become. And that may not always be a good thing, like what you have to become to be with someone. And that's kind of the question I think of the, the series. You know, I think shit happens in smash is like the millennial love call. <laughs> <laughs> to trademark that that's an amazing line um josiah the hexologist starts with an already married couple so there isn't the same will they won't they vibe that the relationships in melissa's and sheree's books have but obviously no relationship is static how do you develop the romantic backstory that readers don't see on screen and how did you think about the relationship being affected by what happens in the book um so, you know, I, I, it's sort of like when I started writing about this couple, it was sort of like thinking about my parents. Uh, I think my parents are sort of this symbiotic like unity, this, this one person in two bodies. Um, 
And, you know, when you're young, that's especially true. And then at some point, maybe in your teenage years, you sort of talk to your parents individually, or I did, and I learned that like, they were people before they were my parents, and they were people distinct from each other before they were a couple, before they were married. And they they had like feelings and ambitions and lives that were rich and weird. And that insight into them that I got later in life was, you know, revelatory. They were no longer just this unit. Uh, they were uh, people and, and individuals. So when I started writing about the Wilbies. I sort of took a similar tact of like, well, I need to figure out who these people were individually before they became this, this very intimate couple so that I can know how they kind of came together and also what distinguishes them and what they are actually doing to support each other and and also to frustrate each other. Um, so I, you know, spent some time writing about their youthful exploits, and I quickly discovered that both of them were reckless, but in different ways. As all was reckless because she, you know, flat of authority and uh, thumbed her nose to the man. And uh, Warren was reckless because he was a born follower who just was a bandwagon joiner of any terrible person who came into his life. And so they were both in some way need of a, you know, anchor or something sort of to level their more reckless impulses. And so that kind of informed how they came together and what they provide to the relationship to each other and how it's based upon a mutual understanding that's not just overlooking each other's flaws, but genuinely appreciating the person and understanding that they are imperfect. Um, and that allowed for all kinds of dialogue and conversation. There's nothing that I enjoy more than writing parlor dialogue. That's what I really want to do. The fantasy, the mystery, the romance, all of that is just the skin that I put on top of like two people sitting at a table and, and talking for hours on end. Uh, so the open communication of their relationship really worked for me as a writer. Uh, and that's sort of where we landed from, uh, yeah, thinking about my parents as teenagers. Oh, that's pretty weird. No, it's actually beautiful. Uh, you know, realizing your parents are people is like one of those milestones that you, you know, hit in like your late 20s, 30s, where you're like, oh, that's that's so interesting. They're just like me? What the hell? Um, you were in a band? Oh. <laughs> you did what in college? I can't believe that. Um, Lyra, your book features not only human characters, but fairy characters as well. How did that play into developing the romantic storylines in A Feather So Black? Do your fae approach romance differently than humans? And how did you think to structure what each you know, race of character actually feels and how they court and how they approach things like romance and marriage? Yeah, I love this question. Um, so the, the main character, Fia, um, is a changeling. So um, although she is at least part fae, um, she was raised in the human realm um, in a kingdom that is heavily inspired by like Dark Ages Ireland. Um, so her upbringing was very much, um, you know, sort of what you would imagine um, when you think of mid medieval, um, you know, marriage and, and romance structures and all of those things. Um, and then when she is thrust into the realm of the fair folk, things are quite different. Um, and I was very eager to explore, um, you know, it's, it's the social mores are very different. The romantic mores are very different. Um, you know, it's more queer normative than she's used to in the human realm. It's more um, sex positive. It's more, um, it's very different um, socially. And I think the, the balance that I wanted to try and strike was, you know, the nature versus nurture of, you know, if you're raised somewhere versus where your heritage is rooted or your, or your blood, um, you know, which of those things are you drawn to when presented with both of them? Um, and that's very much reflected in the love triangle. Um, and yeah, it's very much reflected in the way that the fair folk in my book view love and romantic relationships. <laughs> Um, I think they're they're not very quick to fall in love um, because in in my imagining of Tirnanog, um, a heart is very powerful magic. Um, so falling in love is its own kind of spell. Um, it's a it's a per particular alchemy that they're very um, loath to jump into um, quickly. 
you know, and I think in contrast to physical relationships, which are, are much more normalized for them. Um, so that was a lot of fun for me to explore, especially with a character who is, was raised in a much more um, human um, way of seeing the world, um, to really explore that dichotomy of, of love versus lust, of um, desire versus propriety, of, um, you know, and all of the ways that those two worlds and those two you know, those many different forms of love um, are reflected within herself and how she then um, evolves her own way of seeing how she fits in those worlds. That's excellent. Um, Melissa, you've touched on this a little bit in your previous answers, um, but you've written books which on the surface have a very classic love triangle to them. Did you know from the beginning that your protagonist is willing to be torn between two potential loves? Or did that develop when you were writing the story along with the characters? So I had no idea. So when I very first wrote The Tethered Mage, I didn't even know it was going to be uh, a trilogy. Um, and then, you know, I got a, got a trilogy contract. I was like, great, this is fantastic. Um, and uh, uh, so when I started writing book two, I knew that I wanted to have, I wanted to complicate her relationship by having... Um, uh, a potential political match that she had to consider. And, and very, very early on, I was like, all right, well, maybe it'll be something her mom set up. And it's like, oh, no, uh, I don't want to, I, I don't want to have a political match. And then I was like, you know what, this is a lot more interesting if she sets this up herself, if she sees a political opportunity, because she is supposed to be a political player, and sets up a courtship thinking it's not going to go through. Um, and so I had her set, I was like, all right, that's really cool. Then she's got more agency when she's setting up this courtship, but then there's that, well, how am I going to get out of, am I going to get out of this? What's going to happen? And then in the process, I was like, all right, well, um, there are these, uh, in my world, there are these powerful figures called witch lords, um, and they rule over a like magical foresty domain and they, uh, they're associated with a plant or an animal. I was like, all right, well, let's make this guy who she's going to have this potential political match with uh, a witch lord. Ooh, and let's make him the crow lord because I like crows. And then I start designing this guy and he's got a cool aesthetic and like he's kind of a trickster. And uh, I'm like, oh, hmm, hmm, <laughs> wait a minute. He's really cool. Oh, you know, maybe this is actually a legit possibility and not just a political thing because uh, they started, like I wrote them on the page and they had chemistry uh and there was all this tension between them because he's always kind of like messing with her because of just that's just the way he is but uh um so and they had a lot of chemistry and a lot of tension i was like all right well no this has to be a legitimate possibility now this isn't just a little cute book two plot twist i'm gonna throw away i have to actually i've written myself into a love triangle and as i was writing book two i was like all right you know what i'm not going to decide who who winds up together in the end i'm just going to do this I'm going to follow the characters. We're going to see where they go. And I'm going to deliberately not make that choice so that I can't telegraph it to my readers. Because if I don't know, then they won't know, right? And that, that worked out really well for book two. And then I had to write book three. <laughs> and I had to make some choices. And I was like, oh, no. And my editor was like, do you know? And I'm like, no, I don't. And she was like, all right, don't tell me. Just write it. <laughs> I'll find out like everyone else. So, um, so, yeah, that was then suddenly there was a reckoning with myself because past me had written me into this situation. It was really hard, actually. I was almost in the same place as my main character where I had to decide how this was going to be resolved. And for the record, I'm of the opinion that um, Polly should always be a, uh, an option that not necessarily is going to be feasible for your characters, but an option that you don't dismiss entirely off screen. Like either if you have a culture where that's not a thing, that's then that's accounted for if your characters have, you know, if, if you can tell that the characters are not interested in that as an option, but I wanted, you know, so I made sure there was a, all right, no, at least a couple of these people are really only interested in monogamous relationships. So it's not, you know, um, I think with love triangles, there's always the danger of like, let's make an arbitrary and not seemingly necessary choice between two different flavors of love interest who both seem great. I don't know. Do you, are you in the mood for like strawberry ice cream today? Uh, so I didn't want it to be that. And so uh, uh, so I made sure that that was an option that was uh, that was considered. And in fact, for other characters that I've written, that might be a viable option. It wasn't for these. Um, uh, 
but yeah, no, it was, it was definitely an evolving thing where it was very much the characters were leading me and I did not know where it was going until I had to sit down and plan out <laughs> the arcs where it would be resolved. It's a really good point. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Troy. I was just going to say, how did you figure it out? <laughs> <laughs> it was really hard. Oh my God. I actually wrote to my agent and was like, what am I going to do? And my agent was like, I'm not going to tell you how to resolve this because you have to decide that, but here's some like things to consider and stuff. And like, I, I can't, I can't really, I don't want to spoil it, but okay, we'll have um, to talk off, we'll talk off screen. Yeah. I have a <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can talk later. <laughs> I think we'll have a few minutes of extra time if you guys want to continue the conversation after we get through a few audience questions, um, which I really want to dive into because there are some that have quite a few, uh, we'll call them upvotes here on the side. So we really want to dig in and uh, get these writers the best advice we can get them. Um, Joy. Can I just add one more thing since, since yeah. Melissa brought up the poly aspect of love triangles and stuff? Um, I've, I've been teasing about it for the last whatever or so, but there's Luca and someone said in, in the chat, Sabine and Terrain, and Sabine is, is Luca's other like constant lover, if not like main lover. And so one of the things I had a lot of fun with um, and like the second book and eventually book three is just figuring out um, how with all of Luca's extra partners, how they all negotiate around each other and and like um like Melissa said it's sometimes it's ice cream and sometimes you need a or in in this case sometimes it's weapons sometimes you need an axe and sometimes you need a dagger and sometimes you need poison and so figuring out who is going to serve you best um in Luca's case politically um, as well as romantically is sometimes part of the discussion. And that's, that's, that was really fun, but emotionally just figuring out how they navigate boundaries and um, placement in each other's affection is also um, one of the triangle aspects. That helps a lot. I mean, just to build out that trope, is like so very specific. It's, you know, absolutely amazing that you could like frame it that way. Um, so we're going to go over to our first Q&A question, uh, which I'm going to throw to Lyra first and then to Sheree. Um, and if Josiah and Melissa, you want to chime in um, with some thoughts, we'd love to hear them as well. Um, how do you avoid writing instant love and instead gradually building up the romance between the characters? <clears throat> yeah, this is such a great question and one that I think is very dear to my heart because uh, instant love is one of my least favorite tropes. Um, so I think, I think the, what you have to dig down into is that instant lust is absolutely a thing. Like you can see somebody and be like, that is a hot person. <laughs> um, you know, shit happens in smash, um, as Sheree said. Um, but I think for there to be a love connection above and beyond the, lust connection, you absolutely have to develop a level of intimacy between your characters. Um, and that can happen in a lot of different ways, depending on what the romantic um, relationship is and how it evolves. Um, but I think there has to be some sharing of, um, of secrets, of stories, of backstory, of feelings, of emotions, um, before you can before you can really go beyond um, lust into love. Um, and I think a lot of people miss what is a really crucial step of characters being vulnerable with each other. And that can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, there's no real recipe, just like there's no real recipe with love in real life. Um, you know, there is a deepening that has to happen before um, lust can turn into love. So I have no problem with instant lust on page, um, but I do think that there, you have to find some mechanism of um, deepening the intimacy between your characters before you can start to approach that love connection. Uh, sure, yeah, I, think I you have a good, yeah, a good I, answer for this as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, well. I don't know if it's a good answer, but I certainly have an answer. <laughs> um, I think so. I, I mentioned in the chat that with enemies to lovers, like real enemies, 
you require some amount of time just to work out all the stuff that's between you and between them, the characters. Um, I've never dated a colonizing queen before. Um, but um, I think at some point they do have to have some common ground. And I think um, that does lead into that, that idea of having mutual respect, but I don't think you have to start there. Um, and, but you have to be in some sort of position where each character sees the other and sees them for what they are or what they could be like some sort of, um, idealistic potential. Um, and part of that is that self-deception I mentioned because inevitably they will let you, they will let the character down. They'll let you down. Um, and it happens in the real world too. Like you're, you're the per person you set your heart on is not going to be perfect. And it's how you kind of like the, you need to see these moments of reconciliation with that. Um, we need to see the disappointments, but also um, how, how they get through those. And they don't necessarily have to be these huge, like high stakes moment. Not at first anyway, like um, sometimes it's just like, I don't know, just figuring out, oh, well, I wasn't expecting that from this person, but that has surprised me. And so you kind of recalibrate how you see this person over and over um, as, as time, as the narrative goes on. Um, but definitely what Lyra said about um, this, about showing, having the characters be vulnerable with each other. Um, because I think like these little moments of sacrifice and empathy, especially surprising empathy. Like I love it when a character is surprised by something that their love interest has revealed inadvertently or intentionally, um, but it has to be honest. And um, that that kind of understanding is what opens us up to a, a willing to be connected more deeply and, and to be even more vulnerable with somebody else, whether it's physically vulnerable or more emotionally vulnerable. And to get to that level of sacrifice or of empathy, I think it requires sacrifice, um, like some sort of abnegation, like self-denial or something uh, to put yourself aside long enough to see someone else properly and truly away from everything that you want them to be for what they actually are. And that, I think, is when you're getting closer to the love section that just doesn't happen quickly you don't get to that level of intimacy on page 20 um i think also adding to that aspects of vulnerability is having them play together and like like little moments of silliness um and fun having to work together whether it's in a silly way or a serious way um which is given that I've written two very serious characters and two very serious books, <laughs> um, I don't know how well I've done that, but having them have fun together in some way or another is a good step toward that, that intimacy, I think. I think that was a great answer. Um, Melissa, Josiah, anything you want to add? Uh, um, I definitely agree with the moments of vulnerability, the vulnerability and all that. Um, and uh, I think another another trick you can potentially use, I was thinking of, so in my new book that's coming out um, next year, The Last Hour Between Worlds, I was looking at the relationship and I was like, oh, this has to develop in one night. It's really hard. And so the solution I came up with was to give them a long history. Um, originally, it was going to be, they didn't know each other that well. And then suddenly they fell in love in one night. And I just, that really wasn't working for me. Um, uh, you know, so I was like, all right, you know what, I'm going to give them a long history of being uh, uh, where they were like, uh, maybe kind of dating at one point, or maybe not. And like that they were very, you know, they had this very long relationship behind them that it was building off of so that you can have things come to a head in one night, but that you've known each other, you know, like, even if even it could be like, oh, you could write something where they haven't seen each other in 10 years, but they knew each other when they were kids, there's lots of ways that you can um, build in that background. Like, I mean, in Hunger Games, how really it, you know, they have to have Katniss and Peeta have something going pretty fast. So they build in a backstory that it all builds off of. So it's not, well, why do they suddenly care about each other so much? Um, so yeah, that's the only thing I'd add. No, it's great. I, I think another thing, if you have to, if you have to have them like form a deep bond very quickly, you got to like put them in a jar and shake them up really hard. Um, because 
it's, it's not just with romantic relationships, but one way to get people to bond quickly is to make them suffer together. Whether it's like military boot camp type situation, um, like th that is a a proven thing that that like that the military branches do to build um, esprit de corps among their soldiers is make them all suffer together um, for a long time or a short time, but you make them do something neither of them really want to do and they have to survive together. They have to rely on each other, which is that trust and vulnerability. They have to communicate and they are exposed to the other person's weaknesses. And so they see them very honestly, um, for better or for worse. Uh, so if you have to do it quickly, there you go. Wonderful. Uh, so we have a question that's, I think, really ta tailored to Josiah's uh, focus of writing. Um, Deep platonic intimacy between characters is often accused of being misleading to readers, i.e. teasing a relationship without following through. Um, what are your tips for writing platonic intimacy in a way that doesn't invite such confusion and keeps it distinct from romantic intimacy? Huh. Um, I, you know, I think that one of the things that maybe is not used as often as it could be by writers uh, in the toolbox of developing just um, friendly intimacy is is frank honesty uh, between characters. You know, very often we we kind of rely on uh, miscommunication or deception, but just having uh, you know frank and open conversations uh, diffuses a lot of confusion. And I know that like the confusion can be kind of delicious and part of the tension that we all enjoy. But if you don't want that confusion, it's actually pretty easy to defray. I mean, it's not that difficult. I think the pe the reason people sometimes or writers sometimes don't um, dispel that that tension is because uh, they are unsure of how much um, drama they can get out of honesty. The thing that I've discovered is in my own writing, like honest communication is actually fraught and full of, of conflict and, and, and negotiation and compromise and challenge. It is this very difficult thing to negotiate and write, but it's also very rewarding and it can propel a story in, in interesting and unique ways. Um, and, and so I think like if you're trying not to make this look like, uh, are they going to kiss? Uh, they can actually address that. And, and that's not outside the bounds of like normalcy. I mean, I think we've all, not all, some of us may have had encounters in the past where there was a moment of confusion about what this engagement was. And the way that you kept from getting like an uncomfortable smooch was you just addressed it. At least that's how I, you know, dealt with it. And so I do the same thing for my writing. If you don't want people to be confused about it, just be like, we're never going to kiss. And I mean it for real. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, so I think we have time for one more question and we'll make it kind of quick. But I think this is a really good chance for you all to talk about uh, romances in science fiction and fantasy that you've actually been inspired by in other people's books. And um, you, they don't need to be Orbit books, um, just books that you've read that you were really like, oh, this is such an amazing relationship. I really want to take lessons from this. Or, you know, maybe you've modeled some of your own characters after. Um, so we'll start with Melissa. Or we'll start with Lyra. <laughs> Um, I have a amnesia for books that I read longer than three months ago, so I'll talk about a few of the books that I've read recently. Um, I, uh, I read A River Enchanted by Rebecca Ross. Um, I loved that she showed uh, many different relationships in different phases. Um, so there's one uh, couple who have been married for a number of years, um, and then there's another very um, you know, fresh will they, won't they kind of dynamic. Um, and I, I think she did an excellent job of, of exploring different relationships at different phases um, and very different dynamics um, and the dialogues between them as well. Um, and then I just read um, A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed, and I thought she did a really phenomenal um, Rivals to Lovers um, that was a nice slow burn, but at the right pace where you don't get too bored with it. Um, so those were two lately that I really enjoyed. Uh, we'll go to Sheree. Um, one of my all-time favorites um, is just going to be The Trader Baru Cormorant. 
I don't really want to say much more about it, but it will explain everything you need to know about my writing, about the books I like to read. Um, but the the basic kind of positioning is we have a like a, a book smart person and a noble warrior type and um, extreme devotion such that things get really hard and difficult as they're both trying to figure out a um, situation that they are in. Um, and then another one that I just recently read that was really an arc for Song of the Huntress by Lucy Holland. Um, and that was really good. And I will probably study how Lucy did some of those romance um, kind of dueling romance arcs, um, a very different kind of love triangle, actually. Um, and it's just really good. I think it's out in March or something, March next year. Really good. Awesome. Josiah? Um, uh, you know, what comes to mind is uh, it's been a, a little while since I've read it, but Connie Willis uh, has this book, uh, To Say Nothing of the Dog. And one of the things that she did in that book that I took a lot of inspiration from in The Hexologist is she had a relationship that had these like broad strokes of playfulness and fun. And I and I just adored it. Like there was there was some madcap frolicking and some some goofy stuff and some wordplay, and it was just delightful. And I think for me, I, I sometimes like my romance and fantasy to be interlarded with you know humor and comedy. And she did that so well. She she writes with such like uh, like crystalline like vision. It's 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 very enviable and it's beautiful. And I recommend it to everyone. It's a lot of fun though. Awesome. And lastly, Melissa, welcome back. Right. Hello, I'm back. Um, I wanted to real quick say, because um, I, I missed, I wanted to say something about the question that Josiah was answering about with the platonic relationships. So just very quickly, um, this is something near and dear to my heart because I am on the asexual spectrum. And um, so uh, platonic relationships are really, really important to me too. Um, and uh, I know that one thing that um, that I, I sometimes find, I mean, first of all, you kind of have to let go that people are going to ship who they're going to ship. And that's doesn't hurt you. That's fine, you know. Um, and the uh, but the other thing is that uh, I find it's useful to just come out and be like, "Oh, are you two dating? No, he's just my best friend." You know, like you can just throw something in there, and then some people will never believe you no matter what you do, and that's that's a them problem. <laughs> if you tell them, you know. Uh, but uh, and what was the question everybody else was answering? Book recommendations for book, rec ones? book recommendations with romantic subplots in science fiction and fantasy. Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, I mean, I don't know if anyone else has already said this, but I absolutely have to mention The Jasmine Throne uh, by Tasha Suri. It's just incredible. There's just such an incredible dynamic between those characters and it's just fraught in really interesting ways, but also just really sincere. And I love it. I'm, I'm very worried for what's going to happen in book three. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, other than that, um, gosh. I'm sorry, I'm being distracted by my dog assaulting me because she's realized I've run out of treats. Um, but definitely that one. Uh, I, so in terms of, I don't know if this counts as romantic, but I mean, like, I'm a big Lock Tomb fan, too. Uh, there's certainly a lot of relationships in those books, which are very interesting and complicated in a lot of different ways. And many of them have a romantic or sexual aspect to them, uh, sometimes in very interesting and complicated ways. And honestly, like, I feel like, that's a great way to learn to write about, that book has so many great examples of writing, um, different kinds of attraction, many of them unhealthy, uh, like <laughs> everything from purely mental to physical to a you know more deeply like spiritual or whatever. And, and all the relationships are just so wonderful and complicated and messed up and I love them. That's awesome. Thank you guys <laughs> so much for those recommendations. Uh, I believe that is our time. Um, so this has been such a wonderful session. We love talking about romance in science fiction and fantasy. We feel like it's such an important part of the way people are publishing now. We hope you've gotten a lot out of this session, and we can't wait to see you for another future session of how to write your first SFF novel. Um, there's a link at the bottom of the screen where you can buy all of our wonderful authors' books and sign up for more sessions. And as a reminder, this will be available as a replay, so you can watch it again later. Thank you all so much for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Thank you.